Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to another episode of Fantasy News. I am your disheveled goblin host, Daniel Green, and today we have a cheese spread of fantasy news to try and taste as we explore and express our opinions on various fantastical topics. But before we go ahead and get into that, I want to go ahead and give a shout out here to fellow booktuber Andy Smith and his dream hope project that he's currently launching on Indiegogo to raise funds to open a bookstore along with his wife. I just think this is wholesome and wonderful. And if we could send some support from some goblins and just throw a couple dimes, nickels, dollars, or quarters his way. I think it'd be kind of cool. But without any further ado, let's go ahead and jump into the hardcore fantasy news of the day. Nailed it that time. Good God. First up, we have a look at some art from Mark Somanetti, where he says, here is my fresh new cover art for Toll the Hounds by the almighty Erickson Steven, because that's how it's said on Twitter, apparently. And Oh my lord, I already liked a lot of the art associated with Malazan, but holy crap, uh, this is a wonderful entry into that catalog of portrayals of this brilliant epic by Erickson, and I am a fan of it. If this is gonna be a whole series, I might collect these, because I don't have all 10 Malazan books yet, and this could be the the way I collect them. And I know I normally open up with covers and covers and covers and art, but I wanna try something a bit different here where instead I actually open with some nice beautiful art to get us in a good mood. Then I delve into the stuff I have some kind of negative opinions on and we roll on into the rest of the positive news. So that way there's only one little dip in the middle and we finish out strong. But let's go ahead and get into a Times article that's certainly making waves. On August 9th, Time published a story titled How Extraordinary Abortion scams and review bombing trolls turn Goodreads into many authors' worst nightmares. This, combined with a recent Lindsay Ellis video and Twitter threads regarding this topic, are really exposing how toxic and bad for authors Goodreads is turning out to be. This is a topic we've obviously covered repeatedly here on the channel, but now this is getting attention from the like of, you know, Time. It's an article that really breaks down a lot of these problems. And I also recommend Lindsay Ellis's recent video where she talks about her experience in trying to get published even with her audience and the backlash that can happen there. Some of these things I actually experienced like exact same myself. So if you'd like to know why so many authors are turning out to be passionate about this topic, eh, there's a lot more than just they don't like having this website that they don't control the information about their books and therefore sometimes falsely represent their books and result in problems. No, it goes beyond that. And full disclosure, after my last video, I did have Goodreads reach out and fix some problems for me and try to get me to sign some things. I ended up just walking away from it, not wanting to engage in all this, but there's going to continue to be new developments here. For the positive or negatives, I'm not sure, but I'll keep my eyes open. But now putting our toes into that hardcore fantasy news, the biggest controversy of the community I've seen in the past week is the announcement that Amazon is going to be moving its filming of the Lord of the Rings show out of New Zealand and instead to the UK. Their justification of this is that it will be cheaper, there are better tax incentives there I believe, and also New Zealand's uh, COVID policies are extremely restrictive towards production, which is kind of how that whole nation has tackled this pandemic and why their cases remain so low. This has been met with some mildly harsh, it's even Elijah Wood tweeting out a face palm emoji at the headline, and it's because there is a deep tie between this fantasy epic and New Zealand. A lot about different actors and guilds and reasons for coming there and importance to the country of New Zealand. It's not as clear cut and simple an issue as just the people want the money from the production. There is a real connection to a culture of actors and a community there that really is a part of the Lord of the Rings and having this series have a home. So I don't want to delve into it too much. I think this is something maybe New Zealand creators would have bring a more accurate perspective on, but I'm kind of going to go ahead and say, no, I'm, I'm against this move. I think Middle Earth in our minds, if you want to accurately represent it, is the New Zealand countryside. And now moving it to a place where, yes, Amazon has a lot of other productions, therefore I'm sure it's going to save them a ton of money in multiple ways, feels very business motivated for a series that just recently got a big push of positivity from the fans from the art they put out. It seems like they've kind of rolled back that positive push where I really did see a change in momentum in the fan base. I have felt 
nothing but hesitation from fans up until this point about the Lord of the Rings show. They got a lot of positivity from that image, and it seems to have been rolled back. Okay, I didn't cover well both sides of the argument, and to punish myself, I'm making explain the other side of the argument while doing this workout. The other side of the argument is that New Zealand's COVID policies are so restrictive it might actually be impossible to shoot the show. <gasps> Shooting in the UK could shave the show a bunch of money, which lets them actually improve the VFX and other things like that. A long time actually making the show with the in case better. <gasps> the UK is actually the home of the Lord of the Rings, so it actually feels like for a lot of people, the Lord of the Rings is coming home. This isn't the side of the argument I necessarily agree with. I just want to present it fairly to the other side. I'm sorry. Oh my God, I want this to stop. I can say that my honest reaction to this is right alongside Elijah Woods. And then the final bit of controversial pushback from fandom news I want to cover here is actually about the upcoming Halo TV show. Because the showrunner went on record saying that we're going to see a side of the character we previously have not. Now, the specific quote in bigger context is important here and I want to provide it. Full quote being, probably the biggest challenge with adapting the game is the game is designed to put you in Chief's armor. What we're asking people to do with the show is sort of sit back and we're going to present a side of Chief that you just don't get to play in the games. They also go on to talk about the responsibility and the care they are taking with this franchise. And I've seen some people really have a negative reaction to this saying they're going to change the character, but I think the broader context actually really clarifies what they are saying. It's a medium change issue and it's one that they absolutely have to address or it will be a problem for the show because absolutely Master Chief's character within the games is deliberately held back and reduced so that you, the gamer, can directly put yourself into that character as much as you would like. You don't even really get a face of Master Chief. But now with a show, you don't get to put yourself in the character. Instead, the character needs to bring a performance, an arc that you believe in and are invested in beyond what typically games are having to shoot for due to the fact that there is gameplay at the focus instead of like a character arc. I've had some fans of Halo that I know and respect actually talk about how they could pull from certain books to fill in a lot of the gaps that are specifically being talked about here. And let me know if you agree with that. If you're someone who has enjoyed the Halo books because unfortunately I cannot speak on the matter. For some people who have had some negative reactions to this, let me know what I'm missing in the comments down below. I'm not here to say I'm absolutely right. I just want to see what your reaction is as a diehard Halo fan because admittedly I've been a casual fan of the games. But before we get into the positive cover news again, let's have a quick word from today's sponsor. <laughs> Hello, Warriors of the Light! It's me, your host, the Warrior of Truth, and I'm here to tell you about your new utensil you need in your utility belt of freedom to help Big Gondor stay out of your kitchen. That's gonna be campfire right here. We all know the false king Aragorn's gonna tell you you don't need campfire, that you can just free flow with the pin. But that's not the truth, Weekend Warriors. I'm here to add a new beacon to your call for aid, and that's gonna be campfire. <laughs> Maybe Sauron was telling some truths when he said it's okay to accept help from the outside, and that's exactly what campfire is gonna provide for you. Ew. Campfire is the all-in-one storytelling package that lets you get those languages, voices, locations you see from other worlds whisper in your ear at night when you're crying in the shower. <laughs> Out to the page! So if you want to go ahead and have a choose-your-own-pricing writing aid added to your utility belt of freedom, all you need to do is check out that link in the description. You can help fight for the truth in the world. What is Aragorn's tax plan? We still don't know. Okay, that was weird, but we're gonna go ahead and get into a cover reveal from author Kylie Lee Baker, and it's for The Keeper of the Night. And I love when they do these kind of animated moving covers. I don't know, I'm just, I'm that big a geek where it excites me. Described as a badass biracial reaper girl, a pitch black underworld, demon slaying siblings who would die and kill for each other. Oof, you love to see it, and it's currently available for pre-order with even signed copies. And we also had an interesting update from Denis Villeneuve about the sequel Dune movie. For those of you who aren't aware, yes, the Dune book for these movies is going to be split into two, and it seems that work is currently being done on that sequel, encouraging for fans who actually want to see that finally greenlit, which we've seen some wiffle waffling on. But finally, his big kind of sneak preview is he is saying Zendaya's Chani will be the protagonist, which probably makes a a lot of Dune fans go, why? Why would it suddenly be her story? But I am interested in this creative decision. I understand for more diehard Dune fans that could feel like a wrong turn, but as someone who's not super connected to the story, I kind of from an outsider looking at him, excited to see 
what new perspective that could bring on Dune, because I did feel a lot of the weaknesses were in that second half. So if the second half is told for another story, specifically a character who can provide that better uh, view perspective from the Freeman and maybe flesh out that angle of the whole story more, that would actually bring me in kind of doubly invested because I'm such a culture and like, you know, world reader. Some character that's kind of more based in that could kind of add new angle to Dune I'm really interested about. I also like that Timothy Chalamet will be the protagonist of the first, and then we can pass the baton on to Zendaya, who I would just be excited to see bring what they can to the table to carry a movie like this. And then we had an update about the One Piece live action adaptation. And I have a lot to say here. It's Daniel venting fantasy news today, apparently. But the headline reads, One Piece, new character description for the highly anticipated live action series exclusive. And if you are at all a fan of One Piece, none of these descriptions are going to really surprise you. They just seem like pretty accurate studio descriptions of these iconic characters. But I will tell take this as an excuse to say. I have never really talked about the One Piece live action adaptation as someone who has been decently deep in the series as I am now. And what I can say is, I'm sorry, this is going to be my ultimate uh-uh, no, no, no. There's so many things that make me think this will not work. I'm usually not even the kind of person who will say something is unadaptable, but One Piece gets so much of its heart and humor from the medium of animation and its characterization comes through stronger because of that. Altering it means you have to make such drastic creative decisions that will be directly countering to the source material, but to properly adjust for the medium, this has one of the largest hurdles I have ever seen for a fantasy series that is going to try and be adapted. Then you bring in Netflix, who is extraordinarily inconsistent with their quality, and... I'm feeling a bad pit in my stomach, and that's not even talking about the legacy of anime adaptations that are mixed as well, to say the least. So for all the people in my comments who say stuff like, Daniel's always positive for the stuff he likes, I do in general like to be optimistic, but here, even, even I'm having trouble with that. Also for anime though, we also had the announcement that a live action My Hero Academia movie is in the works with Shinsuke Sato set to direct. I hope I said that right. I did look it up, but I'm not entirely sure still. And what I would like to ask fans of My Hero Academia is, is this the kind of anime where you think a live action adaptation could work? Cause I'm not trying to say that no animation can work in live action. One, we've seen it done before well. And two, we have blatant examples like, I think Attack on Titan is one that's just really obvious could work in live action because it utilizes their own animation in a way that I think would be easier to translate to live action and they're not dependent on the exaggeration that animation often applies for so much of the heart of the show. See what I'm saying? Or am I insane? Probably yes. But you might know this director from I Am A Hero or The Princess Blade, neither of which I've seen, but if you have, let me know if they're good. And then... <laughs> Wheel of Time casting news, which I'm always excited for, but I just thought the reaction to this was pretty funny. But what we have here is that a Danish actress has been cast for season two by the name of Sally Salia. Salia, again, names me dyslexia. It's not clear and easy. But the funny reaction that I've seen again and again from the Wheel of Time community. Every time a blonde actress is hired for Wheel of Time, thousands of tweets, hundreds of billions of comments saying, it's Elaine, it's a blonde woman, therefore it must be Elaine. I mean, maybe. There's other blonde people in Wheel of Time. For the amount of crap Elaine gets as a character, it's funny to see so many people freaking out over the casting. Uh, I personally don't think this looks like it's going to be our Elaine, but I could be wrong, and I'm very open to that. And then we have one final gargantuan story of the day. It was a packed day for Fantasy News Big Stories. And that is going to be that George R. Martin has announced a new graphic novel on the way from him. Titled Voyaging, this idea apparently came to the author in in the 80s in this announcement he said the thousand world stories span centuries and light years and had their own cast of heroes villains legends and colorful characters none of them more colorful than the traitor and ecological engineer Haviland Tuff, the protagonist of a long series of short stories I have collected together in the Fix Up Tuff 
voyaging. He then says as A Song of Ice and Fire kind of consumed his life, he never was able to get around to writing this story, and now he is. He also made a slight hinting that it could have a future on TV, but you know, whatever, that's pretty, pretty run of the mill at someone his level of celebrity. And I'm just going to go ahead and put in the obvious comments that I get so often whenever George R. R. Martin says he's working on anything. Guess this is why we're not getting wins on winner. George shouldn't be working on anything. <laughs> There. Now you don't have to wait. No, I kind of want you to still comment that because algorithm. I screwed myself. Comment something else random for algorithm. But that has been our latest episode of Fantasy News. Like and subscribe if you have not already and hit the Patreon if you like to support what I do here. Have a good one, y'all. Peace. And of course, I'd like to record a special shout out to my latest high tier Patreon, Ethan.